take it away. All right. Yeah, thanks, Vaki. Um, so thanks everybody for coming. So this is, again, as you said, the last talk of the quarter, but uh, certainly won't be the best. So, so that's good. All right, so uh, let's start off with just a couple of preliminaries. So this is actually probably the most technical part of the talk. It's gonna be like the first slide and it's not even gonna matter that much, but I wanna get some stuff out of the way. Yeah, so, oh, before that, I made an outline. So you guys can kind of see like how far we are along. So uh, sometimes there's these like long talks and you kind of get despair, like, oh my God, how long is it? But, you know, we have lots of cutoff points. So okay, so, so statements have finally labels where all the variables are bound by some quantifier. And so what happens is that every statement is going to in the right context, either evaluate to true or false. Okay. So I said it evaluates to true or false in what's called a model. And that's just basically a set with some relations uh, equals and there exists that describe the elements in this in this big set. Okay. So you, you can think of, <laughs> technically this is not correct, but you can think of like the set of all sets as being a model for, for set theory. Um, of course, the set of all sets isn't a thing, but it's, it's a good enough approximation. Okay. So you can write any first order statement and it's either like true of all sets or not true or whatever. Okay. Um, and an axiom is just some sentence. Okay. Um, and for this talk, we're actually not gonna talk that much about the ZF axioms. Um, a couple of them will come up very briefly, but I don't really wanna talk about them too much. Um, now ZF is, so, so Girdle's second incompleteness theorem basically says that you can't have a, a complete and consistent theory at the same time, um, or something like I, I definitely said it wrong, but basically you can't prove that ZF works inside of ZF. So I have this funny thing where you just assume that everything works and, and hope that everything's fine. There is a funny situation. So basically the issue is that like there is no set of all sets, but if you choose a big enough cardinal number, but you, which you can't prove to exist inside ZF, then you come up with a system in which ZF works. So this is kind of funny thing that goes on. We'll actually maybe talk a little bit about large cardinals later. Okay, so that was like the technical preamble, and you can forget all that now, right? Or or remember it. It's up to you. Okay. All right. So I should probably tell you what the axiom of choice is, since I want to talk about choice and things related to choice all today. Um, so to even define this, I have to tell you what the union set is. So you have a set X. The union of X is it's kind of confusing, I think, written out, but it's A and A so that A is an X. Um, so this is a nice little example here. So if X is the set one, two, and two, three, then a, the union of X is one, two, three. So you just, you're kind of going like down one level of nested sets, more or less. Um, and the fact that this set exists is an axiom in ZF. So there's no like weird construction thing. Um, actually, Depending on which axioms you take, you might have to like do a little bit more work to get this exact union set. Um, because there's like some kind of uniqueness, so you get exactly like one. You're somehow cutting it kind of in a very nice way. Um, but it, it definitely falls from axioms of ZF no matter which model people take. Okay. Or which, sorry, which axioms people take. It's well within ZF. Okay. So here's choice. So here's this big uh First order statement. Okay. Um, so as I said, so this is an axiom, right? It's a sentence because everything here is just either like equals or um, there exists or they're all are for all, all that kind of stuff. Um, the, the one thing that technically I'm cheating on is this F. So functions aren't really native in the language of sets, but I, I assume most people have seen that you can describe a function as a set of ordered pairs. 
And so if you if you added enough extra rambling into this definition, then you could actually do this as a first order statement. Okay. So what is it saying? So if you have any non-empty set, there's a function from X to its union set with property that f of a is an a. All right. So let's let's look at what happens with like our x from above. Um, so you can take, so there's two sets, right? That there's a set with one, two, and a set with two, three, and you can just take one, two to one and two, three to three. Okay. You could have, or you could have taken both of them to two. That would also have been fine. Okay. There's actually a number of choice functions we could come up with here. Right. Um, I mean, another example, right? If, if I asked everybody to like raise up, uh, I don't have a video on like raise up one or one or two of your hands. Like show me your fingers. All right, so I can go through each person. I can, you know, pick. So we have like a set of people, and each person has a set of fingers. I can pick one finger from each person. That's that's a playing choice. All right, that's that's a little bit rude, but okay. okay. All right. Oh, there's a, a comment here. Finger. Yes, that's right. Okay. I'm just trying to type out my fingers since I don't oh. <laughs> uh, have my video on, <laughs> okay. per, per the okay. recommendation of Tom Grubb. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Maki. Uh, either that or you lost your fingers tragically. Oh yeah, three <laughs> fingers. Well, I only got three. I mean, you do play a lot of five finger fillet, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right, Greg, sorry about that. Okay, all right, let's move on. All right. um, so let's make some comments about choice. So. There are, there are some weird subtleties to it. So first of all, well, first of all, let's distinguish between two things. So the set X has elements, and those elements have elements. Okay? We have to worry about these two layers. So if X only has finally many elements, so that's like the middle layer, uh, you don't need choice at all. So what you can just do is you can say, there exists something in this subset, or in this element, there exists something in this element, there exists something in this element. And you can just use that finitely many existential quantifiers to find to, to generate your choice function. So there's no there's no issue. Um, now, if you have an infinite set, you can't just you have infinitely many quantifiers, right? That's not allowed in our first order logic. So that's where you start to need choice. Um, there's also this subtlety, which actually maybe I'll read you the quote first. So this is actually not, it's not a direct quote, it's more of a paraphrase, I think. Um, I found this statement on Stack Exchange and it was attributed to Bertrand Russell. So I'll just pretend it's a quote. Um, but here's a statement. So given infinitely pair, many pairs of shoes, you can always choose one from each pair. But to choose a sock from infinitely many pairs of socks, you need choice. So what's, what's the difference here? So with shoes, you have a left shoe and a right shoe. And so there's already like a, in a well ordering, you could say, on like a canonical, like predefined well ordering on all these pairs of shoes, right? So you can just always choose the left shoe, right? And you can describe that function just fine. Now with socks, um, you, there's no like canonical, well, assuming your socks are symmetric. Uh, my, mine usually are, I usually have just like plain white socks. Um, so I can't tell, you know, there's no left and right socks, they're just all socks. So I, I can't distinguish between my left and right socks. So there's no like canonical way to choose, which is the, which sock I would pick for each of these pairs. Um, now, you might complain and say, well, why can't you just put an ordering like one, two on all your pairs of socks and then choose sock one? Well, you have to choose that ordering for each pair of socks. So you don't really escape the issue. Yeah, so yeah. there is a bit of a uh, ad absurdum argument that kind of happens there. Also, possibly dumb question, but in your definition, is there an issue if the empty set is an element of X? Um, right, because you have to map the empty set to something and it has to be in the empty set. Yeah, I think you're right, Sam. I think uh, I think I did miss something. Yes. Yeah, I think you have to always say X is empty and all the elements of X are not empty. Yes. Okay. Cool. I believe you're correct. Yeah, that's my point. Like <laughs> yeah, I was, I was trying to think like right before the talk, like I, I know there's some weird things with empty sets, but I, I missed all of them, missed some of them. Um, now, what is interesting, so actually you can go back here. 
if every element of x only has one element, you don't need choice because you can just pick that one element. In fact, you can actually describe it. You can say f of a is equal to the union set of a. And then, there you go. That's the element. Um, so you have to. So it is very subtle to work with this axiom. It's, it's very strange. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's talk a bit about um, some other statements that are equivalent to choice. Yeah. So I'm sure a lot of you heard this before, but uh, the axiom of choice is obviously true. The well-ordering principle is obviously false. And who can tell about Zorn's lemma? Um, so I did learn while preparing for this talk that this is apparently due to Jerry Bona. I don't know really who that is, but uh, I've definitely heard the quote before, but I just didn't know who it was. Okay, so let's go through some. Uh, this is literally just a listicle. This is this talk is mostly like a BuzzFeed article, so bear with me. Okay. So the first thing that's equivalent is just that Cartesian products are always non-empty. So somehow to me, this is like the best argument that choice should be true. Because <laughs> it seems so absurd to me that you could have a Cartesian product of non-empty sets that could be empty. But if you have an infinite Cartesian product, right, an element of the product is just, you have one element from each piece of the product. So for it to be non-empty, you have to you know, choose something from each uh, factor. And so it's like very, very directly equivalent to choice. Okay. Um, the well-ordering principle is a little more complicated actually. So actually these, these two go together, these next two. Um, so there's this notion of, I don't wanna get into what ordinal the cardinals are today, but um assuming choice cardinals fully describe sizes of sets so which is which is what that third thing says every set is in bijection with some cardinal so zero one two three four all the natural numbers are cardinals alpha not is a cardinal that's the cardinality of the natural numbers right the, the only countable infinite size you could have um and then there's alpha one alpha two alpha omega there's this um there's there's a lot of cardinals out there yeah. um and so it's equivalent to choice actually to say that every set is in bijection with some cardinal number so in some sense it's, set, it's choice gives you like a well-defined size for sets which is kind of a big deal um and the well-ordering principle is an easy corollary of this because every cardinal is also an ordinal so there's a natural ordering on the cardinal and so you can just take some set right as a in a in bijection with some cardinal and then it gets the ordering from that cardinal um this is actually really weird because for example if you try to say well order the real numbers this way you get something extremely not constructive uh because you don't <laughs> yeah it's, it's extremely not constructive to do this with like any real world set so it's not really helpful but it, it's good to know Famous one is Zorn's lemma. So this is probably one that a lot of you have actually used. Um, so the statement's always a little bit weird to, to parse, but uh, you have some post set, and if every chain is bounded above, then there's a maximal element in the post set. Um, so somehow this is like the hardest one to, I think, parse when you're first learning it, but it's also the most useful. So these maximal elements are really handy. Every actually just has a basis. Probably have seen this one before. Uh, Tychonoff's theorem. Which is similar to the Cartesian products one, but it's saying that a product of compact spaces is compact. No, no Hausdorff assumption, just compact topological spaces. Um, and the last couple I had to look up. So uh, it's actually also equivalent to every cumulative ring having a maximal ideal. So there's a there's a way to port Zorn's lemma back and forth with this fact. Um, if you construct a, a silly enough ring, basically. And Vacuo like this one. So if you assume the krein millman theorem and the bonnick alioglu theorem, then you recover choice. And choice is also sufficient to prove both of these results. So these are, yes. Insert uh, approval face here. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so these are both results from, uh, I guess, functional analysis. Uh, krein millman is more of a convex analysis thing, but uh, anyway. Um, and. This list is also good because like we're gonna see like slightly different versions of a lot of these again. So this is somehow representative of the example we'll do all day long. Okay, so this is actually the biggest section of the talk. I wanna talk about statements that are weaker than choice um, because there's a lot of wiggle room 
basically. So, um, so somehow you have ZF and ZFC, but like ZF, like ZF with choice is like so much insanely stronger than just ZF that there's like a lot, a lot, a lot of middle grounds. So, um, there's, and there's actually a couple of really like easy, easy quote unquote ways you could uh, start thinking about this. So, so this is again choice, although I forgot the every element is non-empty part. Um, so what if you weakened the above statement? So you could say, okay, what if this is only true for sets at, at sets X that have countably many elements? Or you could do something like you could require all the elements of X to be finite sets. Um, and so the, the first one here is called countable choice. So the this you're making well countably many choices, right? It'd be like if we had countably many viewers today, we could uh, you know pick one finger from each of them. Um, now, if you require all the elements to be finite sets, that's actually called finite choice, um, which is really funny because it's it's completely different than countable choice. So you you think finite choice is like the set has finally many elements, and it's like ha 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 finite choice, very funny because it's we already talked about it. You don't need if X has finally many elements, you can just use quantifiers to get to make your choice function. Um, but it turns out to actually be slightly interesting to think about what happens when all the elements in X are, are finite sets. Um, and then uh, if you're in any kind of subject that uh, uses results that require choice, typically you don't need the full strength of choice to actually prove them. So I, this is some examples from functional analysis. So we already mentioned Krein Milman and Bonnick Ayoglu, but Han Bonnick and the Bear category category theorem uh, are also examples of these things. So we'll 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 see this again actually. All right. So um, first one I want to talk about is countable choice. So I think it's maybe the easiest to understand. Like instead of making arbitrarily big choices, you're just making a countable choice. Right. Um, now. Countable choice is, is actually quite weak in terms of all these things I just talked about, but you, it still gives you, um, sorry, what, what do I want to say? If you don't assume countable choice, things go very badly, like immediately, if you try to do any sort of analysis. So for example, um, if you want to show the countable union of countable sets is countable, you need countable choice to do this. Um, and it's kind of for a weird reason. So the way you would think about proving this result is you do some kind of diagonalization argument. You could like you write out the countable sets as like uh, like S1, S2, S3, S4. Uh, you could write them all in like a big grid and you snake through the grid to get your bijection or or your surjection, I guess. Um, but what's funny is that so saying that S is countable just means that there it says that there exists a surjection from N to S. But it doesn't say like it doesn't give you a concrete surjection, and so you have to actually choose countably many such surjections, and that's that's actually the technical issue here. You have to make that you have to choose countably many things. Um, now, interestingly, um, saying a, a countable union of countable sets is like adding up countably many objects, right? um, or you could think of it as like so alpha not right again is the it's the countable infinite uh, cardinal. And so it's like you're multiplying alpha naught by itself to get alpha naught. So even to prove, well, actually, I'm probably going to get in trouble if I say this, because this is a specific countable set versus an arbitrary one. So it, I think philosophically, it's like this. But I think technically, it's actually not. So I probably should not have written that. Okay. Um, another fun fact. So uh, this almost seems this seemed really topological to me when I read it. Um, so in a metric space, every accumulation point is a limit of points not equal to itself. So when I say an accumulation point it just means that like there's a you have some set A and some point X, and every ball around X intersects A. Right? But to actually get that sequence that will converge to X, you need to pick something from each smaller and smaller ball. Right? Now it's a metric space, so it's uh, it always messes up. Second countable, so you have to make countably many choices. So countable choices is enough. Um, and it actually turns out that if you do this, 
if you assume this for every metric space, it's actually equivalent to countable choice. Um, so this actually really threw me off. It's like, what? How can you have an accumulation point that's not a limit of things? Uh, so, but that, that's kind of how fundamental countable choice is in, in analysis. Um, you also come up with, you can also use different cardinals. So you could use any bigger cardinal, kappa, and say like kappa choice. Um, but I'm actually not going to talk about that today. So, all right. Another one is dependent choice. This is a little bit different. Um, so you start with some binary relation on a set. So R, you can think of R as like a less than, okay? And X is like the real number, say, as an example. So we're saying for every A and X, there's some B and X so that A is less than B. Right? So that's, we're assuming that. That's what it means for the relation to be entire. And so the axiom of dependent choice says that for any entire binary relation, you have a sequence of increasing elements. Okay? Um, so you have you know, one less than two, less than three, less than four, less than five. Now, this is kind of like countable choice because you're making countably many choices, but it's it's actually stronger because you're doing them uh, sequentially. So the the choice of x n depends on the choice of x n minus one. So that's why it's called dependent choice. Um, again, this is like a, a countable thing. So there's a version of this that works for other cardinals. So this is kind of the easiest to wrap our heads around. Um, so it's it's actually strictly stronger than Countable choice, so it implies countable choice. Um, it's equivalent to the okay, Lowenheim Schollen theorem, which is a just a model theory theorem about um, making bigger and smaller models. Anyway, um, it's also equivalent to the Bonnick Aliaglu theorem, which is pretty funny. Um, I, I thought maybe I, I found that one surprising. I didn't know that one. Um, there's also a so you can imagine a version of Zorn Zorn's lemma that's like a countable version. So you could um, basically have to strengthen the assumption. So if you have a, some post set where every chain is actually finite in length, so like there's no there's no like infinite chains, then there's a maximum element in the post set, and this is equivalent to dependent choice. Um, it's a little bad I don't have a citation here, but I was talking about this with uh, Jacob the other day. So hopefully that's I'm trusting Jacob here. So I'm throwing him under the bus if this is false. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's possible I also said this slightly incorrectly. Anyway, but roughly speaking, Zor uh, countable Zorns is, is more like dependent choice than countable choice. Yeah, was there a question, sir? Okay. Cool. Um, all right, this is my favorite part. So I, I feel bad. I'm throwing a lot of like definitions, but they're all like really short definitions. Okay. So, Could you hold on for a sec? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. This is a. Um, a very basic and naive question, but I kind of want to do a sanity check. So if you, if you have a finite set mm -hmm. um, without the axiom of choice, you may choose an element of that set. Is that correct? Or is that incorrect? Um, so what you can say is like, so you have some finite set X. Actually, if you have any set X, okay. you can always pick one element from it by you saying like there exists A in X. And then you can use that as part of your argument. Assuming, okay, if you know your set's not empty. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now I see the, okay. All right. I was going to have a follow up question, but you just took care of it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Choices when you have to make like a lot of choices at once. Okay. That's a good way to put it, actually. Thank yes. you. Yeah. And so countable choices when you make countably many choices at once. Yeah, hence um, the countable union thing. That's right. Yeah. And dependent choices, you're also making countably many choices, but not all at once, like in a sequence. Yeah, that makes sense. Which is slightly so much, which is actually significantly stronger. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. All right, good. Good, good question. Um, okay, so there's this notion of a, a filter on a set, which is just describing like quote unquote big sets. Um, so the way they're actually axiomatized is the following. So filter is a collection of subsets. So the empty set is small. Empty set is not big. The entire set is big. OK, that makes sense. It's the biggest set you could have. Um, if you have a big set and a set that's bigger than it, then the, the bigger set is also big. So it, bigness is closed under supersets. 
And the last one is the, kind of the, the key property. If you have two big sets, their intersection is still big. So it's, it's closed under finite intersections. Um, and so an ultra filter is just a maximal filter on some sets. Um, so maximal just means by inclusion. So like you can you can keep trying to add more and more sets. Um, but at some point, if you, have, if you add too many sets, then you'll, you'll have two that are disjoint, right? And then their intersection will be empty, which is which contradicts axioms uh, one and four. Right? So that's that's why this is actually like not trivial. Um, now, the way you would normally prove the existence of ultra filters is by Zorn's lemma, right? You can just kind of look at like all filters that are bigger and show that uh, well, all those chains are bounded above. Um, but it turns out that the simply the assertion that every filter is contained in an ultra filter. Okay, it's called the ultra filter lemma or principle or theorem. Um, so it follows from Zorn's lemma, but it turns out it's strictly weaker, but it's still very useful. So, and this is interesting because um, this doesn't have to do with countability at all, because this is saying like for any set X and any filter on X, it extends to an ultra filter. So this is somehow orthogonal to like the last couple axioms we were looking at. Um, yeah, it's, it's like a, instead of a weaker version of like choice directly, it's a weaker version of uh, Zorn's lemma, but it kind of goes in a different direction. Okay, so here's here's my here's the next another listicle. So ultra dilemma, the Boolean prime ideal theorem, which is actually very close to being a restatement of what I just said before. If you know what a Boolean algebra is, which I don't know very well actually, but um, it's almost the exact same sort of thing but reversed in some sense. Um, equivalent to saying that every net has a what's called a universal subnet. Um, this is <laughs> This is a very funny way of putting it, actually, I think, because like, first of all, it's confusing to understand what a subnet is. Um, and a universal subnet is actually has a, this really weird property that it's eventually, I, so if you take, so a subnet is like a kind of like, and that's sort of like a sequence, but generalized. So it's actually not like a sequence, but morally speaking, it, it's like a sequence. And so it lives in some topological space, right? Um, and you can say, given some subset A, uh, does it eventually stay in A? Okay. And somehow, if like, you have a neighborhood of sets, it's like converging. But a universal subnet is just saying, for any subset A, the net eventually is in A, or the net is eventually in the complement of A, which is, I think, really maybe hard to wrap your head around. Uh, so it's like eventually, it's no matter how you partition your space, it's either in one piece or the other. So uh, this is the definition of a, a universal net? Rough, roughly speaking, yes. OK, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, there is actually a, a proposition about ultra filters that says that, let me go back. Um, if you have an ultra filter, then any subset of x is either in the ultra filter or it's not. So an ultra filter actually has this nice property that every set is either big or small. Or that's actually, that's oh yeah, I said that trivially. Sorry, every set or its complement is big. Sorry, that's the proper way of saying it. Yes, that's that makes more sense. Yeah, <laughs> that's not that's not topological. Okay, yes. Um, so, so, so that's kind of similar to this um, this notion. Like every set or its complement is big. Uh, could I ask you a question about the ultra filter? You said that the the ultra filter lemma is weaker than Zorn's lemma. That's correct. Yes. So, so how would you prove a statement like that? Like, is it constructive or is it just a matter of not being able to prove that they're equivalent? Um, so I'm, hmm, that's a, that's a tough one. So yeah, it's just I, I can't really give you a, a good, a good explanation like right now why that is true, but it is known to be strictly weaker. Um, the way that like model theorists or set theorists would do this is they're able to construct models with very specific properties. And so they, they, they can make this like model of set theory in which, um, so assuming that ZF is consistent, they can come up with a model where the ultra filter lemma holds, but choice fails. And so they can actually like, you can actually, there's this method called forcing, which was um, mm. pioneered by, what's the guy's name? Paul Cohen, I think, in the like, 60s and 70s. 
And so he's the first guy to really like figure out how to actually distinguish these sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. And then his techniques have been developed since then. Yeah. I just wanted to know whether it was some kind of constructive thing, but it, it sounds like it is like they actually build models where they have the results and then they can produce counter examples. Yeah, I think how constructive it is depends on your perspective. Um, but yes, okay. Yeah, and there's usually kind of, um, what am I trying to say? Yeah, okay, well, I'll talk a little bit about that later too, actually. Okay. Um, oh yeah, it's also, okay, this is also equivalent to every community ring having a prime ideal, which I thought was very funny. Um, it's equivalent to Bonic Ayaglu. Oh, whoops, that's the end of the list, okay. <laughs> um, now, there are a number of other results that are implied by the ultra dilemma, but are, I'm actually not sure if they're strictly weaker or not in all these cases. Greg. Um, yes. Didn't we say Banach Alauglu was uh, uh, equivalent to one of the countable or dependent choices? Maybe I'm misremembering. Uh, so Banach Alauglu, if you assume Banach Alauglu and the Krein Milman theorem, you can recover. Oh, that's right. No, uh, okay, choice. okay. That's right. That's right. But right. Banach Alauglu itself is strictly weaker. Awesome. Thanks. Um, you know, what's funny is actually I didn't find a reference saying whether Krein Milman is strictly weaker or not. So that might just be unknown. Apparently that's kind of complicated. I saw some long post about it. Maybe we can talk about it later. Okay. I, I actually know very little about that, but <laughs> okay. Sweet. All right. Um, so here's some other results that can be proved from the ultra dilemma. So on Bonnock, all the different versions can be proven from ultra dilemma. Taikonov's theorem, but just for Hausdorff sets can be proven. Um, the Alexander subbase theorem, which is like basically you can test compactness just on a subbase. Um, and also the axiom of finite choice, <laughs> which is one we mentioned before, where you just have x, every element of x is finite. And actually, four follows from uh, two, because if you have a um, if you have a whole bunch of finite sets, well, it doesn't, it doesn't quite, but it almost does. But if you have a whole bunch of finite sets, then each one is a compact Hausdorff topological space. Um, now, the empty set is a, is a compact topological uh, Hausdorff space, uh, but you can you can modify the argument a little bit to, to actually get the non-emptiness. Um, yeah, and I, one in four, I found did find references that one in four are actually weaker than the ultra dilemma, but two and three, I, I didn't. So I'm not sure if they're equivalent or, or weaker. All right, so that was actually but a one pretty- One question. Oh yeah. Uh, this, this MUG reference, is that 2015 or 1915? So it's 2015, but it's just a, it's a book. It's actually a book mostly about topology, but he mentions choice and weaker versions of choice to prove some results along the okay. way. Um, I think it's actually more like 2020 when I actually looked this up, but it's just the whatever Google DibTech gave me. Yeah, I just wanted to get like a scale for like, how recently are we knowing these results versus not? Well, okay. So I, I'm sure these results have been known much longer than 20, actually the, the preprint that I found online is actually 2020. I mean, I don't think these were discovered this year, but it's just the, the book that I'm referencing is, is quite new. Yeah. So people still write about this nowadays, but uh, I think the results are, not particularly old, but like a few decades old. Okay, so um, there's actually only one axiom I want to talk about that's not consistent with choice, and it's called determinacy. So it, it's a little bit weird. So you take the set omega to the omega. So this is just the set of all countably infinite sequences of natural numbers. And you take some subset, and two players play a game. They alternate picking natural numbers. So they pick like, you know, one, three, four, two. There's no like, or there's no rules. They can just, this alternate picking numbers. It doesn't have to be increasing or unique or anything, just alternate picking numbers. And so what happens is that after infinitely many steps, they have a sequence of natural numbers. And if the sequence was in that subset A, then player one wins. And if it's not, then player two wins. So, this axiom says that no matter what set you start with, one of the two players has a winning strategy. Okay. Um, this is actually, I, 
a lot of people do study these these kinds of like game axioms because there's a lot of like modifications of these that lead to different uh, outcomes. But let's we'll talk about this one. Um, so what's weird is that every so omega to the omega can be given the product topology, right? Because the natural numbers are just a discrete space, and you can give the, the product a topology. Um, so every Borel set is determined just in ZF, which is a surprisingly strong result, actually. Um, it's also true that the axiom of determinacy implies every subset of R is Lebesgue measurable. <laughs> um, so determinacy and choice are not compatible, right? Because choice gives you a non-Lebesgue measurable set. Insert disapproval face here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is a weird axiom. However, um, determinacy actually implies countable choice. And it also, impl it also implies the continuum hypothesis. Um, and it is consistent with dependent choice, but I don't think it implies dependent choice. So it's a very, it's a very strange axiom. So there are people who study like determinacy plus dependent choice and, and see what you get there. Yeah. Cause you, cause you still have like some choice, but you just, they also get this nice, uh, game property. Um, Greg, do you know if, uh, the statement, every subset of R is Lebesgue measurable is equivalent to, well, in ZF is equivalent to determinacy? Um, I do not know, but I don't think that's true. Okay, cool. Yeah. Greg, I don't, yeah, I don't know for sure, but I would, I would, be, I would doubt that's true. Okay. So knowing that, um, these two are incompatible, like, can you produce a set which does not have a choice function somehow? Like, can you do something directly like this or do you have to go sideways through these Lebesgue measurable sets? um that's a good question this is this is really out of my depth now so like this is this is really out of my expertise um yeah so ba basically i have no idea how constructive or non-constructive this is but in the, the fact that every Borel subset is determined uh, is kind of like somehow that would be like extremely constructive right like a very very difficult construction somehow but uh yeah i, I don't know about the, the converse Wait, uh, say that last sentence one more time. Oh, I don't know about the converse. Like, Maybe I don't, like... I don't know about the non, about the Lebesgue measurable sets and uh, how what, much what, that's destroying choice. What was the comment about Borel sets? Oh, so like this, this first sentence here that like it can be shown every Borel set is determined. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Like some of this is like quite difficult, but it's very you're building it up, right? Like it's. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I transfinite induction or something. Yeah, something weird. Yeah. Okay. All right, and this last section is very, uh, I don't know how much I'll get into this, but I think it's very interesting what what you can't, what what is completely independent of choice. Okay. Because um, everything we've done so far is either like, it's either literally choice, implied by choice, or it doesn't like choice. But these this last section is things that don't care about choice. They're happy either way. So here are a few set theory examples. Um, so this so the continuum hypothesis and the generalized continuum hypothesis are independent of choice. This is probably actually a pretty famous result, I would say. Um, and this was proved by uh, Girl and Cohen. So it says Cohen 03, but that's just a book that he wrote that got published in 03. The result's actually from like around 1970, originally. Sorry um, to interrupt again. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could uh, explain a little bit uh, what you mean by independent precisely? Oh, sure. So uh, it just means that the, okay. So if I take ZF plus C, um, so let's, so Z, the zermelo frankel axioms plus choice. Yep. Um, there is a model in which ZFC and the continuum hypothesis is true. And there's a model in which ZFC and the negation of the continuum hypothesis is true. Ah, okay, cool. So it's consistent to add both the hypothesis and its negation. Okay, I gotcha. Not at the same time, obviously, but- Of separately. course. Yeah. Great, yeah. thank you. And actually, <laughs> so the reason there's two citations is basically because Girdle gave uh, a construction that works, I think, with continuum hypothesis and Cohen gave one that doesn't it works with not continuum hypothesis. 
or, or vice versa. Um, somehow one is actually much easier than the other. Yeah. Okay. Or one required like more advanced techniques that Cohen had to develop. Uh, called it's called forcing or model forcing. What is the generalized continuum hypothesis? If it's quick to say. Yeah. So continuum hypothesis. So the continuum hypothesis says that alpha one is equal to two to the alpha naught. So the the next the set the first uncountable cardinal is equal to the size of the power set of the first of the countable cardinal. Um, generalized means that so if you take if you keep taking power sets. You just increment by one each time. So like alpha two would be two to the two to the alpha. Some of this is like, I don't know. I don't really like GCH or CH. It somehow seems like too restrictive, but I mean it's independent. So maybe I, maybe I shouldn't have an opinion. Okay. Um, now constructability is, is really weird. So it's, it's called V equals L. So V is what's called a von Neumann universe, and L is called the constructible universe, I believe. Um, and this is a really weird, this was also studied by Gödel and Cohen. And somehow the von Neumann universe is like, you start with the empty set, and you progressively take power sets. And you have to, at some point, you have to take limits to, to get bigger and bigger things. But uh, more or less, you're taking power sets. And at each stage, you also take all subsets. So you can generate all sets, roughly speaking, by uh, taking repeated power sets and taking subsets. That's very roughly speaking, but that's kind of the idea. Um, now, the constructible universe says you do the same thing. You take, keep taking power sets, which is one of the axioms of ZF. You have the power set axiom. Um, but the only subsets you get are the constructible subsets. So the subsets that can be defined using a first order logic statement. At each stage, um, and so you get a much what you would think is a much smaller thing because when you have these like very very uncountable sets, but you can only use like finitely long uh, first order logic statements. Right? So you you expect there to be like way fewer constructible sets, just counting. But um, it is consistent with I, I'm not giving a, a very accurate description of what's going on here, but it's kind of a general idea. Um, but this is actually consistent with choice. Um, it's actually, maybe I shouldn't say it's independent of choice. It's actually probably a bad way of saying it um, because it's it's actually extremely strong to assume this. Yeah, it's actually not independent of choice. This is a bad, this is a bad statement to put here. Um, it actually implies choice and it implies GCH. Somehow if, if all the sets are like only coming from first order logic statements, it's much easier to do set theory everywhere. Um, yeah, and so I have this comment about measurable cardinals, but those are it's just really big bad cardinals. Okay. Um, uh, in in your opinion, does this uh, action of constructability imply something like really bad, maybe other than this cardinal thing? Um, so it's not my opinion, but most people's opinion is that this this axiom is way too strong. Gotcha. Um, so people, people who do set theory like to talk about these really big cardinals and see what happens when you have these really, really, really big cardinals. Actually, measurable cardinals are what are called large, large cardinals, which is kind of <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are small, large cardinals and large, large cardinals. Oh, man, I love math. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but the fact that it like, implies choice and GCH is also somewhat suspicious. Oh, JJ has a question. Does it imply, does it contradict strongly inaccessible cardinals? So I don't believe it. I think I looked this up and it, it does not contradict that. So measurable cardinals are significantly larger. The measurable cardinals are a type of strongly inaccessible cardinal, but they're they're larger than like the smallest strongly inaccessible cardinal. Yeah. So strongly inaccessible cardinals are small, large cardinals. The measurable are large, large cardinals. So it doesn't contradict. That makes sense, JJ. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And the last one I had here was yeah. um, so the existence of inaccessible cardinals, so weakly or strongly, um, is also independent of choice. So having a large cardinal like this actually gives you a model of ZFC. Basically, a large cardinal is large enough that 
you can you can't reach it using the other axioms of ZFC. It's it's too big. And so inside that set, you can come up with a model of, of ZFC and everything's nicely self-contained. But um, of course, by girls incompleteness, you can't prove that ZFC is consistent inside ZFC. And so because a large cardinal will give you a model of ZFC in which it's consistent, that means that ZFC can't prove the existence of such a large cardinal. It's yeah, you get a you get a infinite loop. Um, and then this slide is just a whole bunch of fun examples. So, okay, we will list them all out here. Um, yeah, so there's an example from number theory. So like, actually, this first one is Hilbert's tenth problem, I think, or related to Hilbert's tenth problem. So like, there is a polynomial with the property that whether it has integer roots or not is independent <laughs> of CSC. <laughs> um, um, there's this uh, ring where it's it's, dim it's projective dimension is either two or three, but it depends on the continuum hypothesis. Um, and then I listed some from analysis and more specifically, more like functional analysis and nice stuff. Um, and th these are all really weird, but so I like it. everywhere in math that's sufficiently complex, like you can come up with these examples. There's actually, I was actually at a talk this morning and someone brought up this statement that's slightly different, but it was like, if ZFC is consistent, then there is a, a quantum game uh, that has some weird property. Okay. And so, you know, these, these things kind of pop up just almost randomly and they're a little bit unavoidable. All right, I am running out of time, but maybe I'll just talk about the, this is actually a very short slide. Okay, so. um, this is kind of funny. So this notion of constructive set theory where you don't take the law of the excluded middle. So P or not P isn't assumed to be true, right? Or it's like not not P isn't necessarily equal to P. Um, but there's this theorem, Dyakonescu theorem, that says that uh, in constructive set theory, if you assume choice, you actually do get the law of the excluded middle back, which is uh, really funny, actually. So I guess these constructive set theorists don't, don't usually assume choice, or at least not full choice. Um, and the, the proof's actually um, relatively short too, which is which is even funnier. Okay. Um, okay. And then I have like a billion references that I haven't read. Um, so I guess I'll I'll end here. So thank you, everybody. All right, everyone. Let's thank the speaker. All right. Any questions? What's your, uh, uh, I have a question. What's your favorite of the functional analysis things that are independent of choice or equivalent to, or, you know, anything? I think this is so ridiculous, this state of things. <laughs> it is extremely ridiculous. Um, I mean, my favorite's got to be this ultra filter lemma, like, and all the things that are equivalent to that. Um, I mean, it's not, okay, it's not a functional analysis thing. So I guess what, Bonnick Aliagui was on that list. Yeah. Um, I think it's just very absurd that you can kind of, like cut down Zorn's lemma to make it so much weaker and still get a lot of these key functional analysis results. Yeah, I don't I don't remember if we mentioned this one, but I think for Krein Milman, if you mm -hmm. add ultra filter, you get choice to Krein. Well, that's, that's right, yeah. So that's implied by what I said, I think. By ultra filter cause... implies Banakalauglu and Banakalauglu plus Krein Milman is uh <laughs> is choice. Okay. That's right. Yes. Completely absurd. <laughs> Very absurd. Did you mention what's roughly this? No, no, no. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah. What what's roughly the statement of Krein Milner, or whoever the names are? Oh, so it's so Krein Milner asserts that if you have a a compact convex set, uh, its set of extreme points is not empty. That's that's the simplest okay. version of state. Yeah. In a in a locally convex space. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And and just to make sure I remember my two for you, Bonic algo is that like the ball is compact, basically. Yeah, the unit okay. ball of the dual space is weak star compact. Yeah, cool. cool. Uh, and I know you mentioned Han Bonnach is implied by something you said, but is Han Bonnach equivalent to something you said, or do you have to like add in something as usual? Um, so Han Bonnach is uh, a little bit weaker than Bonnach I Oglu. <laughs> so it sounds really funny to say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it, it, so Hanbach is, is weaker than ultra filter lemma. So there's one reference I was looking at 
So if you just take, so, so here's here's why it's weaker. Right. If you take Han Bonnock and Kryn Noman, that's not enough to get full choice. Ah, okay, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. That's so. So it, so it is a little bit. It is a little bit weaker, but it's it's not much. It's a, it's only a little bit weaker in some sense. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Any other questions? All right, let's uh, thank the speaker again. All right, I will stop recording.